Halfway around the world from the land in which it originated, jazz has taken root in Australia. The speed with which it came here and the dedication and enthusiasm it's inspired from Australians, whose lives are very different from those of black Americans of turn of the century New Orleans, makes the story of the development of jazz in Australia as interesting in its own way as the beginnings of jazz itself. It's intriguing to think that Sydney may have heard jazz before Chicago. The first important jazz band to play in Chicago in February 1915 was the original Creole band from New Orleans, builders coming direct from the Hippodrome Theatre in Sydney, Australia. Extensive efforts to confirm the band's visit to Australia have failed, but the possibility can't be dismissed. Advertising has always had to be at least remotely plausible, and who in Chicago in 1915 would have bothered to promote a band in that way, unless the journey to Australia was made regularly by American vaudeville performers? These ten programs will attempt to trace the development of jazz in Australia from the earliest days of this century through the 20s and 30s to the beginnings of the Second World War. The perspective will be from that of dance musicians who were interested in jazz. Therefore, some of the records which you'll hear during this series can at best be described as hot dance records rather than jazz records because they date from a time when Australian musicians were first coming to grips with the idea of jazz and hadn't yet mastered it. You'll also hear some of the imported jazz records which were influential for Australian dance musicians. This record is The Sunflower Dance by Vess Osman, recorded before 1915 in the ragtime era which preceded jazz. <laughs> discoveries of the 1850s in Australia brought in a new wave of immigration. A lot of Americans came over, some of them black, and they contributed their share of life to the diggings, and where the miners went, entertainers followed. American circuses and nigger minstrel shows, as they were called at the time, toured the gold fields and Australian cities. For example, the Melbourne Argus advertised that Rayner's original Ethiopian serenaders would be appearing at the Mechanics Institute before going on to Hobart. 
the show was comprised of Negro melodies and original burlesques. The program began with an overture, followed by songs such as Commence Ye Darkies All, As I View Now from La Sonambula, The Sweeps Refrain with Tyrolean imitations, Stop That Knocking and Phantom Chorus. Part two included a banjo solo. With oddities, absurdities, comicalities, profundities, contradictories, incongruities, improbabilities, hoping that all will show their infirmities by granting indemnities to patronise his disquisition on sheep's meat, pig's meat, and every other kind of meat that you should feel meat to listen to withal. This to be performed by Mr Moran, alias Brother Bones. The whole evening's entertainment would conclude with a plantation jig. Minstrel shows and spirituals introduced the Australian public to an entertainment based on black American elements of story, dance and song. Vaudeville audiences so enjoyed the shows from the cotton fields that by 1880, a classical music enthusiast writing about trends in popular taste in the Victorian Review thought it shameful that instead of liking his type of music, the great mass of the labouring classes of the city had a mania for nigger minstrelsy. Eric Pierce was a pianist in Sydney who recalls a minstrel show that he saw. The well-known one that I remember when I was a child was McAdoo. His uh, crowd had concerts in Sydney Town Hall. I don't know if they had instruments, but I know he had a, a woman, a Negro woman, as little thing she was. Uh, she was known as the, the American Nightingale. And uh, a song that she used to sing and went over feet was me, the cows are in the clover. That was not jazz, but, but uh, McAdoo uh, was a bass, but he, he brought this team of, uh, of Negro out. Vaudeville made people aware of musical trends in America in much the same way as records, radio and cinema would later. Vaudeville theatres were to be found in the big coastal cities. Australia was one stop in a global vaudeville circuit. Carl Maiden was a drummer who spent his formative years in vaudeville and in circuses. Well, in the family, in 1884, my father's father-in-law, he had a family of uh, three sons, and uh, there, there was five girls, and they all did an act. And my father, too, played instruments, and he did a musical act, besides playing the cornet. Well, in 1884, they're doing a pantomime at the Theatre Royal, and the and the family got a hundred pounds a week. Now, in 1884, that was a lot of money. Yes, you may be sure of that. Really? The Theatre Royal in Sydney. I've still <coughs> got the old contract here, signed by Musgrove, Gardner, and Dad uh, Williamson. I was uh, 15 at the time. We'd come back. I toured with my father and mother all through Indonesia, which you in those days was Java, and we went through Burma, straight settlements, and all through India, from Calcutta, Lucknow, Cornwall, Alabad, and Bombay, and over to Ceylon. This was with a circus. Yeah, My father was a bandmaster, and we only had a band of six. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I didn't get paid. My father gave me the job on account of paying my way, the hotel expenses and so on. Another performer who started in vaudeville was trombonist Dave Meredith. First of all, the Kid Boots would play six months in Melbourne. And they'd have three shows, one following the other. You see what I mean? Then we'd do uh, Sydney for six months. Then we'd come up to Brisbane and do three or four weeks. Yeah. Then we'd go right back over to, to, to Melbourne and do a return to what's done, then go to Adelaide and then to Perth. Then we come all the way back again to Sydney and do a revive season there, then right over to, to New Zealand, to Auckland, to Wellington and... and uh, all the smalls and... And, 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 and this was the, the general route of the vaudeville acts? Yes, yes. They all do the... the That's circuit. Circuit yeah. or fuller circuit. Yeah. All the small, what they call the smalls, and every theatre in New Zealand, in the small towns, not like in Australia, they have proper theatres. They put on a big show, put an opera on if they want to, most of them, Napier and Hastings, Danny Vites and all those, all those different places. Uh, we went around there, we did the right to circuit, then we'd come back again, do Australia again and we go over again. 
But you'd go over and with a different show. While the while you weren't going around the circuit, you'd be rehearsing another show, see? One night stands, you'd have two sets of scenery. One set of scenery would be uh since Friday and say we played played this town tonight. Yeah. Then we go to Toowoomba. Well when we're playing the next show, uh, in this town, that the first night show would go on. When we get there that'll all be ready and we keep keep moving and we travel by train right through, we lived on the train and everything. Well, if you're out to say two nights in a place you'd break up go over the hotel and have a good old wash up. As Sydney and Melbourne grew, so did the demand for professionally organised mass entertainment. The growing enthusiasm for dancing reflected this need. I then met a, a man who used to play by himself at dances. Very nice dances and in private homes a lot, and, but just by himself and he what was, what was known as a black man king. He played in the blacks. And I followed him and he sort of got me and I had a very good connection on, on playing for private affairs and small dances and that, just by myself. Why we play, I played black notes only. Well, not only the black notes, but black note keys. Keys like uh, D flat, G flat, B natural, yeah. mainly an E flat minor, things like that. We played for these dances. At those days, it, when I played with Sid Ray, we played waltzes, chavises, glances, quadrilles, albus, polkas. Later on, in the Valita and the Larica came and we did those. But then when I was playing by myself, it was waltz, two step, waltz, two step, practically all night. They might put a shot each in. This is still before World War One. Uh, yes, and, and during World War One, where we any plane was generally done in aid of the war effort, and we we charged our feet. Oh. And after World War One, then came a period when they brought in what they called uh, ragtime or ragaton and uh, they also brought in tangos in dances. Well then, in came the one step, and it was just walk, that is old time walk, and one step. In the days of, uh, on the Mississippi, Robert E. Lee, and Row, 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 and numbers like that. But they were the, the one step. This is Harry Cove playing How Do You Do Miss Ragtime? and an imported record from the United Kingdom, recorded before 1915. Well, dream you won't go right on your way. Say goodbye to Step Branch, you have had your day. Keep traveling, you are the dancers, you. Keep traveling, I've had enough of you. Classy dance, you've no chance, you can't win my heart. Got big light, go on high, say you better start. Just see who's coming along the gate. Look who's coming this way. See how she does that world. My, but that girl, some girl, how do you do, Miss Ragtime? I talk to you, Miss Ragtime. When I see you coming, I forget the rest. You're the only one that's sweet to done the best. I'm dead in love, head or heels in love, always thinking of you. Look out here, ragtime dear. When you're near, I feel queer. Well, there's a funny feeling comes along with you. Makes me happy, 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 never blow. How to do, Miss Ragtime? How to do? Don't leave, oh, you'll 
big ragtime girl of mine. I adore, I implore, don't you make me pine. My baby, please stay around a while. My lady, please smile a ragged smile. Dancing feet, music sweet, there's some feeling nice. Ragged tag, music jag, oh what paradise. Miss Ragtime, you've got me all in all. I can take in some fall. Isn't that ragtime grand? Please me, oh, take my hand. How do you do, Miss Ragtime? Hats off to you, Miss Ragtime. When I see you coming, I forget the rest. You're the only one who's waiting down the bed. I'm dead in love, head or heels in love. Always thinking of you. Look who's here. Ragtime, dear. When you're near, I feel queer. Oh, there's a funny feeling comes along with you. Makes me happy, 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 never blow. How did you do, Miss Ragtime? How did you do? Uh, well, Ragtime uh, is an Alexander Ragtime band. Yes. That, uh, well, there's an instance. That came in before the war. I mean, yes. Yes, that was, uh, that was in the corner. Well, that was the beginning of jazz. Now, oh, it would be, oh, I could go back five years before that. Dark Town Strutters, uh, Coon Band Contest, and so on. They were the second place and same thing right now. That was Sydney bass player Bob Oddington, and here's a recording made at the time of a Coon Band Contest by the Imperial Regimental Band. Much of the credit for Australia's vogue for dancing around the time of the First World War goes to an American, Billy Romain, and a Canadian, J.C. Bendroit. Romain arrived in Sydney from San Francisco in 1912 as Roaming Romain, the wandering violinist. 
Romain opened the Crystal Palace Dance Hall opposite the Regent Theatre, which went well until larrikin behaviour forced it to close. But he had seen the possibilities of public dancing, and in 1914, Romain, Jim Bendroit and George Irving opened the Salon Deluxe at the lower end of William Street. Billy's American ragtime music played for dancers. Three violins, flute, clarinet, trumpet, trombone, drums, piano and bass constituted the band. The Salon Deluxe was formerly the Imperial Skating Rink, which Bendroit had opened in 1912 for roller skating. Bendroit had been an actor, boxer, lumberjack and all-round athlete. Between the wars, he became the most important entrepreneur in the Australian dance and jazz world. Late in World War I came reports of jazz music which was sweeping America. A vaudeville promoter, Ben J. Fuller, asked Billy Romain to form a jazz band. The other four members of this first band were all Australians. The advertisement for this band's show, which appeared in Sydney papers in June 1918, read... National Theatre, twice daily, 2.30 and 8. Ben J. Fuller presents, for the first time in Australia, Belle Sylvia and her jazz band. Ben J. Fuller, first again. First again in introducing the most curious of musical ideas. The height of eccentricity. The acme of skilled and musicianly nonsense. In his wildest moments, Sousa never dreamt of anything like this. See that crazy drummer. See that dippy fiddler. See that perky pianist. You can't keep your seats while the jazzers jazz. Hear that farmyard jazz. Music that wafts you to the country. Ben J. Fuller's liveliest, laughablest, most novel offering. Australia's first jazz band. Sydney audiences crammed into Fuller's National Theatre to catch 25 minutes of the big American musical craze. Belle Sylvia and Amazonian lady baritone sang with them. They were an immediate hit. For six weeks they did their act in Sydney on the same bill as yodelling comedian, dancing conversationalists, some jugglers, a review called Candy Ship, the singing Folvey Sisters and the boxing kangaroo. The show toured with success to Melbourne, Adelaide and Brisbane. There the tour ended and the band broke up. There were probably other musicians playing jazz tunes or calling themselves jazz bands, but in mid-1918 none had made more than a purely local impact. Romain's band made jazz known nationally and it's from his tour that the history of Australian jazz begins. Harry Maiden, the band's trombonist, and his brother Carl, had lived and played music in San Francisco between 1905 and 1914. Carl Maiden recalls. When we came back to Australia in 1914, my brother Harry was a trombone player, but we come back with an American pianist, a very, very good, in those days, jazz has just started. Yes. And we come back to a former band with the trombone, piano and drums, and we're going to hire extra musicians to come and join us. Did you hear about jazz in the United States before you came back? Yes. I met several people, Australians, and they said that the music in Australia, the, the, there was no jazz music here at all in those days. They'd never heard of real American jazz orchestras. I, in the meantime, had learnt the drums. I was in a dance hall yes. playing the drums. My brother was in the Barbary Coast, which is a well-known place in San Francisco, and the pianist was playing at the Barbary Coast. Who was the pianist? And the pianist was a real good, one of the best jazz pianists I ever heard. He, his name was Al Tatro. Well, right away we joined the Union. Joined the Union in the city. And, and you, you already knew before you left yes. America about jazz? Yes. Coming dear, heading here to this pier. If you hurry, we will make it never fear on the old Dominion line. Ain't she sailing pretty as she hugs the shore, steaming for Baltimore. Here's the paddle churning, here's the water churning. She's the queen of the Chesapeake Bay. 
Come on, Nancy, put your best dress on. Come on, Nancy, for the steamboat's gone. Everything is lovely on the Chesapeake Bay. All above the bounty more, and if we're late, they'll all be sore. Now look here, Captain, let's us get that boat. We can swim and listen, we can float. That is the home in a good old tune. Upon deck is the place to stone. Cuddle up close beneath the silvery moon. Sailing down the Chesapeake Bay. Hurry, dear, the steamer ain't a mile away. Down the bay, on the way, see the smoke pouring from a funnel's gate. Honey, ain't that picture grand? Put your bib and tucker on and come with me. Sight you'll see, you'll agree. Here's the dark is humming while the steamer's coming. See the bell of the Chesapeake Bay. Come on, Nancy, put your best dress on. Come on, Nancy, for the steamboat's gone. Everything is lovely on the Chesapeake Bay. All above the bouncy morning, if you like, that will all be sore. Now look here, Captain, let us get that boat. We can swim and listen, we can float. Don't miss the harming, a good old tune. Upon deck is the place to soon Cuddle up close beneath the silvery moon Sailing down the Chesapeake Bay That was the record imported from the UK Arizona Jack playing Sailing Down the Chesapeake Bay Recorded before 1915 I'm to come back here We gave an audition for Jim Bendroid You've heard of Jim Bendroid? Yes well, the three was played for Jim Bendroid in 1914, in May 1914. However, due to union troubles, they couldn't take a job with Bendroid. Well, the next thing, Ben Fuller, who was running a vaudeville house, where the Mayfair is now, the Mayfair Theatre in Castle Ray Street, the Mayfair, it was called the National Theatre before the Mayfair was there. So. Ben Fuller heard the three of us play, and he engages to the pit orchestra. Yes. So that meant to say they would be replacing again three members of the orchestra in the pit. Yes. Once more the unit stepped in and said we couldn't take the job because we <laughs> again would be... Now, yes. Even though you were it, union members? Yes, we were mm. union members, and the two of us were born in Australia. Mm. So anyway, Ben Fuller said, now, you boys play here just the same. Never mind what the union says, I'm engaging you. So the other three musicians, the other three musicians, got, got, uh, they had to walk out, they couldn't play with us. So the three of us, piano, trombone and drums, for six weeks did a vaudeville show. Yeah. <laughs> Two shows a day in a matin and a rehearsal Saturday morning. Jazz developed in black communities in different parts of America. Though New Orleans was the unrivaled leader of jazz, other cities had their own rudimentary forms of it. The route of a jazzman to Chicago was not always up the Mississippi on a steamboat. Freddie Keppard's original Creole band from New Orleans was in San Francisco in 1912. Jazz ceased to be an underground music of the black community when five white men from New Orleans made their debut as the original Dixieland Jazz Band at Risen Weber's Cabaret in New York on 26 January 1917. War service overseas made Australian musicians aware of jazz. There were 167,000 Australians abroad at the end of World War I, and the last troop transport didn't leave England until 23 December 1919. Jazz was popular by then, and the original Dixieland Jazz Band was playing in London. Harold Fraser, a pianist, was serving overseas at that time. Uh, I saw a service in Gallipoli and France for uh, two years in France and then was trans got a transfer to the Australian Flying Corps and in became England. a fighter pilot 
and is there that I become interested in jazz and uh, the first intimation of the jazz band business was when we formed a band in the mess at Leighton and consisted of uh, on the banjo uh, Major Wackett, now Sir Leslie Wackett on the violin Mr N.B. Love who was famous for his commencement of flying at Mascot and uh, a big miller. Also the drums were uh, played by Captain Harry Covey, Australia's Air Race. And I got then joined with Eric Battershaw and we learnt the jazz dancing and, and uh, musical part of it at the Hammersmith Palais de Dance. The band there was the America, for American uh, Dixieland band. Oh, the original Dixieland yeah, jazz band. That's right. Well, did you guys go along and to ha to listen to the band? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And not only then, uh, the dancing part of it too was they had uh, instructors in dancing. You pay another sixpence or something like that, and uh, you dance around and get taught jazz properly dancing to this band. This was after the war. You this stayed was, on in England. Uh, yes, for, yeah. for uh, 12 months after the war. You listened to the original Dixieland jazz band quite a lot at yeah. the Hammersmith yeah. LA. Yeah. And, and had you listened, heard jazz on records? Were records available then? No, uh, I don't uh, don't remember any records at all. I know because there was no records when we, we were playing. Yeah, it was just the and, band uh, yeah. live. Had you had lessons from the band at the Hammersmith Palais? Oh no, saxophone and all that, and the drums, we had to get the ideas of it at all, you see. Yeah. <laughs> Dixie Jazz Band One Step by the original Dixieland Jazz Band recorded in March 1917 one of the first jazz records ever made. This first program has traced some of the influences on Australian popular music in the early decades of this century through ragtime and elements of black American music and song which came through the vaudeville theatres 
and influenced local musicians. Also, local musicians had had some overseas experience. Next program will continue with Hal Fraser when he returns to Australia.